test.
morning. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Desert. I'm Julia Alberg Burbank, your worship associate for today. As we begin, we acknowledge that we are on the historic homelands of the various bands of Kauia people, and we honor the unique relationship that we hope emerges between our community and the indigenous people and their traditional territories. Let this acknowledgement serve as a reminder to recognize, honor, reconcile, and partner with the Kauia people whose lands and water we benefit from today. In this congregation, we welcome people of all sexual orientations and gender identities, of all ages and sizes, people of all economic statuses and professions, of all physical or mental abilities, people of all races, ancestries, and cultures. We welcome you wherever you come from, whoever you love, whatever your immigration status or civic engagement. We welcome all those who will learn and grow with us as we commit together to embrace the rich and beautiful diversity of the world and to build a community centered in justice, compassion, and love. You are welcome here. We're glad you're with us this morning. We'd like to take a moment now to greet newcomers and visitors. If you're here for the first time and you're comfortable, you're invited to stand or raise your hand and Reverend Ian will come to you with a microphone. Right now, please just share your name and where you're from and after the service, we can get to know you better at coffee hour. <laughs> we'll try it. Oh, there. Oh, there. Good morning. I'm Jane, and my husband and I moved full time to Palm Springs from San Francisco in September. And I've honestly been waiting for you to lift your mask mandate. And um, so here I am, and I'm hoping to come every Sunday now. And uh, eventually, hopefully, my husband will join me. Welcome. 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 We're so glad you're with us today. To bring uh, Denise up for a couple of announcements. Good morning. I'm Denise Jansen Eager, Social Justice Chair. Just a few brief announcements from Social Justice Committee. The uh, Photos you saw up on the screen as you were listening to our wonderful music was from the Drag for Drag rally last Tuesday. Uh, 14 UUCOD friends and members joined up to celebrate drag and support drag in the Coachella Valley and throughout our nation. And I know many more of you were here in uh, support and lifting us up as we were there. Uh, another announcement is that voting for Share the Plate is open. Look in last Friday's newsletter for a link to vote to find out about all the uh, uh, selected nominee nominees and to vote for your favorite nine. Here's the catch. Voting ends on Friday at midnight. Really important, you vote. Okay. And finally, happy Earth Day weekend here at UUCOD. We are finally not finally, we are finishing up our uh, environmental film festival today with this wonderful film called Love Thy Nature. It will bring you back to loving the environment around you. Please join us, 1130 in the community room. Thank you. One more announcement, our annual congregational meeting is next Sunday. This is your opportunity to vote for our new board members and our new budget. You will also hear from the board president, the minister, and the standing committees about our year. So please join us on April 30th at 1130 in the sanctuary or on Zoom. You can find the Zoom link in your newsletter. 
If you would like to be on our email list to learn more about us and our programming, please contact us at admin at uucod.org. And now, let's ring our Tibetan bowl to begin our service and then listen to our music for centering. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. I'm Ian Riddell and I have the honor and joy of serving this congregation as its minister. However you found us, however many times you've been here with us in person or online, welcome. We are a congregation grounded in our commitment to love and evolving tradition that celebrates the richness and beauty of individual lives and commits to working together to weave tapestry made stronger and more vibrant by our collaboration and by the sharing of our lives and our thriving, loving, just and sacred future for all of life. We begin today with the words of Bengali poet and philosopher Rabindranath Tagore. The same stream of life that runs through my veins night and day runs through the world it is the same life that shoots in joy through the dust of the earth in numberless blades of grass and breaks into tumultuous waves of leaves and flowers. It is the same life that is rocked in the ocean cradle of birth and death, in ebb and in flow. I feel my limbs are made glorious by the touch of this world of life, and my pride is from the life throb of ages dancing in my blood. That dancing in our beings, let's worship together today. And let's begin by rising in body or in spirit and joining your beautiful voices together as we sing our opening hymn number 175, we celebrate the web of life. Please join me in the words on the screen as Reverend Ian lights our chalice. May love be the spirit of this church. May the quest of truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our aspiration. I'd like to invite Sarita Gonzalez up to help light our biopot candle. Please join me. We light these candles in solidarity with black, indigenous, and other people of color as we journey toward our spiritual wholeness. May we, as a beloved community, work to dismantle racism and all forms of oppression. May we live out our principles so that justice, dignity, and equity for all prevail. Thank you. 
the holy mess. Embrace the imperfections, the chaos, the holy mess of your beautiful life. Kelly Ray Roberts, artist. Oftentimes I find as hard as I try to fight against it, the clearest path back to hope is to embrace the chaos of the connection to the interdependence of everything. As Brene Brown reminds us, we are a people who are hardwired for connection. And in Article 2 of the Unitarian Universalist Association documents, we are asked to honor the interdependent web of all existence. In other words, we're not meant to go it alone. For me, when I'm too long on my own, flailing in life's currents, I can begin to lose hope. What restores me to some semblance of balance is remembering that everything is connected and tapping into the imperfections and the mess. Resting in the interdependent web of all creation shifts my perspective. I don't want to go it alone. I humbly acknowledge my place in the scheme of things, and I do my part to repair what's damaged, working one step at a time through that holy mess towards hope. Hope for me is the space that holds room for connections between people, creatures, and our environment. It is the breathing space of our beautiful lives. It is not a passive space for me, but rather a space where the hard work of repair, connection, and love takes place. It is where we show up as our truest, most helpful selves and engage with our world and each other. So I hope that you too will find ways to embrace the imperfections, the chaos, and the holy mess of your own beautiful lives. At this time, we ask that the ushers come forward, and we thank you in advance for your generous offerings. I don't know about you, I feel like a butterfly <laughs> after that. Um, good morning to all. Yep. I'm waiting for my first slide here. This is a high-tech um, zooming and all, everything else, but uh, I had to go back to PowerPoint, and I just uh, cue them one slide at a time, like my old science presentations. <laughs> there we go. So um, my name is David Emerson. I'm a new member here, just one of the seven that just joined this year. Um, and I immediately, well, I guess I joined the Sacred Grounds group before I joined the church. Um, and uh, you may have seen me out with my sunshade hat, working on the ir irrigation and planting things. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're up to and ask you to join in with us. Um, next slide. There we are. Um, our proposal is to develop some demonstration gardens. Uh, of course, we want native plants in the ground for their beauty, but we also thought that we would cluster them together uh, as they exist in nature and label them so that people would, when they're walking through, would understand what, they, what they're seeing around them. And also that they would want to do that in their, in their landscaping at home, in their churches, in their uh, libraries and businesses. Um, Mel uh, Wilkinson, Sue Engel, and I were in a California naturalist class this spring and just presented the capstone project on April 15th. And we had designed it to actually integrate into what the Sacred Grounds was doing all along. Next slide. Yeah, right on. Um, as a community, having our church grounds um, reflect our seventh principle is an important demonstration of our commitment to our core uh, values. Next. And the Sacred Grounds Initiative, I uh, assume you're familiar with it, uh, is, has a portion that has us uh, work on habitat for native plants and animals. And this initiative was approved in March 2020 
Does that sound like anything else to remind you of? The very next day, uh, the church was shut down for COVID for several years, and we have been resurrecting it, and now we're ready for action. Next. Um, you might be familiar with this book, but you're probably familiar with one by Rachel Carson in the 60s called Silent Spring that pretty much uh, uh, started up the environmentalist movement in the, in the United States. It even got uh, the uh, Nixon administration to enact the Clean Air and Water Act and inspired 20 million people to celebrate the first Earth Day in 1970. This book by Douglas Tallamy has inspired many people also. He quite quotes Roy Dennis, who is a famous ornithologist, to say that land ownership is not just about privilege, it's also about responsibility. Uh, he pointed out in the book that only 5% of the land in the lower 48 states is in natural self-sustaining ecosystems. 95% has been manipulated by humans. National parks alone cannot sustain the diversity of life that is needed for humankind to thrive. So we need homegrown native national parks, such as what we're planning to do here on the grounds and in people's yards all over the country. Next. And so our method of how we would do this is, as I mentioned, select native plants that will be clustered in groups as they are found together in nature in order to emulate the natural communities in which they exist. Next, be ready for this one. Uh, there's a quiz at the end of my talk here to see if you remember all these. Uh, these are the four areas that we hope to develop in particular. And uh, the, if you notice any asterisks, those are all plants that are already here. So we're in a good state anyhow. Um, we also want to get a mix of annual plants. These are perennials that will survive year after year. And um, these annual plants are the ones that are blooming right now. And we hope to select enough so that they ha have different bloom seasons so that we'll have color year round here at the church. Next. So you can see the aerial view that I stole from uh, Google Maps. and. Uh, the uh, blow sand areas were like a natural sand dune. It blows from a, uh, off of Via Vale, around the side, behind the church, and across the south wall. That's where there's now over 300 endangered milk vetch plants that have sprouted up. So we're doing pretty well in a natural way. Uh, we've, um, and then you can see the others that will have accessibility from sidewalks and also from the parking lot. Next. Uh, also, we plan to build signs with a description of the plants. Um, so that way, we, people will know what they're looking at and know something about them. Here's the next one. is a picture of a uh, sample that we had made. Uh, I have three copies of it because they kept smudging something that I couldn't find, but they wanted to make sure they uh, gave us something good. So I'll bring them next week. I've course forgot today the, of all days uh, you see that we have the name of each plant and the scientific name a little bit about how the plant works in its ecosystem and also how the Cahuilla people use that plant in their daily lives uh, that is our wonderful chalice symbol that we were able to get into the si each sign and then a, a QR code if you're familiar with those you bring your cell phone and you can then link to a, a page on Calscape that would learn more about that plant and its environment. Next. Uh, the last part is not just for the plants, but also we will have wildlife being attracted to the insects that are on the plant, or the insects on the plants, and the birds that come to eat the insects, and the lizards that live on the insects and the plants themselves. So they have to have a place to live as well. So next, and there it is. Um, this is Mel's uh, quote. She she has we we are developing a. Uh, lizard lounges for the lounge lizards, the, uh, the uh, desert iguanas and all the other lizards we have are here that have to escape the uh, road runners that are constantly on patrol to try and pick, catch them. And then the big day will finally come this fall. Right now this is just an idea, a thought, a plan. But uh, in October, November, when they have t will have time to grow roots and make it through the next summer, we'll bring this uh, 
this plant to life, literally. Um, each plant will cost somewhere around $90 to $100. That's including the plant, having a sign made for it, and a stake to mount it into the ground. Next. Um, this project, we think, will increase our outreach for our, from our community to the greater Coachella Valley community. And hopefully the homegrown National Park concept will start to spread. Uh, we also want it to be an active educational experience, so we will invite school groups to come in and take a guided walk through, our, through these areas. Next. And that's it. The, uh, please join in, either if you roll up your sleeves and help us, or giving financial support to this program. Um, once completed, we bring everybody you know to come on and see it and spread the word. Uh, we really can use your help. Um, I'll be around uh, during the coffee time, and uh, there's a clipboard on the table inside the, the foyer uh, patio, or what is it, Lo lobby, to uh, sign up and get in contact with us, and you can join in and help out. Thank you. and sorrows that we have chosen to share with each other today out loud, but we know that there are joys and sorrows that live in the quiet of each of our hearts and our minds, and so we pause now for a time of quiet and reflection. I invite you to be comfortable in your seat, to relax your shoulders, relax your arms, and just breathe deeply. Whatever way is comfortable for you, breathe deeply in this space, the space which is already holy as all of the earth is holy, but which becomes more holy and more special to us because we gather here together. Here in this place, we embrace the holy mess that is each of our lives and our life together. We are connected to each other. We are never alone. And so whatever we carry in our hearts, in our minds, our spirits, however our bodies feel, we bring them here now. We pause in quiet reflection, in the loving embrace of this community, in the loving embrace of all that is connected to us through life. We breathe into the quiet of this space. May all beings know hope. May all beings know peace and an end to suffering. May all beings know love. Will you join your voices now as we sing together our hymns for meditation, Spirit of Life and Fuente de Amor.
We've been, I've been taking a moment before my sermons these weeks to say thank you to a group of folks in our congregation. And so today, inspired by Earth Day, I want to say thank you for the folks that help keep us uh, safe and clean and keep, help keep our grounds beautiful and holy. And so I want to say thank you to everyone whose hands, hearts, and spirits uh, bring them here, sometimes at 6 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday, sometimes uh, on a Saturday afternoon, sometimes each and every day to help keep our um, grounds and our building safe and beautiful and uh, wonderful to work in. And so I want to invite anybody who's a member of our uh, facilities and grounds committee team to raise their hand and wave it high and proud. I don't know why there is reluctance. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody who's part of our um, newly revived safety committee, I invite you to, uh, to, you'll be hearing a little bit more from this group eventually, and I know that there's at least one, two other people in the room. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All of the wonderful people, all those people are wonderful too. All of the also wonderful people who are uh, leaders in our sacred ground movement or volunteers. If, you've, if you're one of the people helping to organize or if you're a volunteer, if you've come out for weeding or planting or helping keep the grounds beautiful and holy, will you please raise your hands so we can... Wow, thank you. And, and for all of those volunteers who come out to pick a weed or just help keep everything beautiful and wonderful, I want to say thank you also to the folks who stick around after service. We've already, you know, our Tally folks tidy up from coffee, and we have volunteers who come into the building, make sure the garbage is taken away, make sure the chairs are all where they're supposed to be, make sure everything is safe and tidy. So anyone who does that during the week, I know that there are some of you who are here. Thank you for that. Thank you to all of you who take care of our space. Now, there are four mammals that live in our house. Four personalities, four sets of needs and wants. Two of us get around on two legs, and two of us on four much shorter legs. The four-legged mammals in our house need for us to take them out walking two or three times a day, which we usually, usually all enjoy a great deal. But we are coming to the time of year when the sun, and therefore the pavement, are getting hotter and hotter, and we worry about the pause at the ends of those four legs. So we have to set out for our walks earlier and earlier so that things really haven't heated up yet and wait at the end of the day and later and later until the sun has gone behind the mountain before we walk. And we have to be strategic about where we walk. We're always searching for shade. One of our favorite routes includes a section of the east side of Duval Drive between Gerald Ford and Frank Sinatra. There's a part of that stretch of road that passes by several neighborhoods with higher walls and higher shrubs inside those walls on the east side of the road. And so the sidewalk is in shade well into the morning, even in the weeks of earliest sunrise. That's why it's one of our favorites. And the canine members of our household love it as well because they love sniffing at the bases of all the bougainvillea and other plants. And because there has been grass grassy and cool the whole way. Unfortunately for the dogs, though, this grass is now gone, torn up and replaced by rocks and stone and soil as the neighborhoods in the valley begin to adapt to new rules about grass and lawns and replace the green with landscaping that doesn't take as much water. It's a good thing, of course. It's good that we are paying attention to the fact that we live in the desert and that how we use water has a big effect on the ecology of our region. Another of our favorite walks is along the pathways that run along the Arroyo from Wilson Park on Frank Sinatra down to Country Club Drive. There's usually some shade here too. But over the past little while, we've only been able to do half the pathway from one end or the other because the middle section of the pathway runs down across the Arroyo 
and lately it's been covered by a stream of moving water. Melting snow that's made its way down the mountain and into the usually dry river that runs through parts of our cities. Both of these disruptions to our daily constitutional, small though they are, point to climate change and our responses to it. The multiple atmospheric rivers that brought so much precipitation to so much of California had a hugely varied effect on the lives and lands of Californians. Flooding and mudslides up and down the state caused devastation and destruction, and the big storms brought huge snow accumulation in the mountain state, including those around our valley. That's where the stream in the Arroyo and other places Along with the destruction, these storms also brought relief for much of the drought our state has been suffering for over the past decade. It hasn't replenished the groundwater yet. That takes much longer. But our reservoirs are more than full right now for the first time in a long time. That drought, the removal of grass along Duval and other parts of the valley is part of our local response to that drought, an adjustment that we're making to how we do things in our lives to help mitigate for some of the effects of climate change. These individual changes, we are told, can make a huge difference. Not planting grass, conserving water in our homes, buying more local foods, driving electric cars, changing how we eat as families. And we live in a national culture that places so much emphasis on this free choice and individual work and willpower, and which routinely balks at and is often hostile to any suggestions that larger systemic changes are needed. We see this in conversations about racism and systemic racism. We see this in conversations about weight stigma, and we certainly see it in conversations about the environment and how we live. Individuals are chastised for not recycling. Individuals are mandated to remove the grass from their front lawns and use less water when they shower and cook. All of this may seem necessary, and, and it is, but golf courses and water parks in the middle of the desert and growing almonds where no almonds should ever grow are often rarely questioned. Individual use of plastics is demonized, while large corporations which create the vast majority of pollution operate unchanged and unaffected to buy electric vehicles while we don't pay attention to how we design and build our urban spaces to reduce our dependence on those vehicles. All of these choices, the big and the small, are grounded in values. They are grounded in the stories we tell and are told about our place as humans on this earth. They grow from our deepest beliefs and theologies. In Braiding Sweetgrass, indigenous scientist and writer Robin Wall Kimmerer writes, the stories we choose to share our behaviors have adaptive stories So our response to the climate crisis must, of course, be changing individual behavior. But it must also be understood systematically, systemically, culturally, theologically. The 2009 Interfaith Declaration on Climate Change said, we recognize that climate change is not merely an economic or technical problem, but rather at its core is a moral, spiritual, and cultural one. We share and support our moral and spiritual and cultural lives with stories, and the stories we tell matter. One of those deep stories one that lives in the heart of much of many cultures' way of doing things can be found, even if it's not in our upper mind, can be found in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis. And God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. I can't read that. Uh, your headset mic's cutting in and out. Can you switch? Yep. Okay, there we go. Thank you. 
I'll start that again. <laughs> then God said, <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, that gets me in trouble. Okay. <laughs> let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, God created them male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Humanity created separately from the other animals and given a special appreciation by its creator is placed in dominion or stewardship depending on the translation over the other creatures and over the earth and is to subdue it. We are to use it for our needs. It is ours to manipulate and to profit from. The Islamic creation stories differ slightly, but the Quran also sets humanity as separate from the rest of nature. Nature is a means to an end, not an end in itself. Now there are, of course, many Christians, Jews, and Muslims who understand these foundational stories differently, who read in them a call to be stewards rather than dominators. But it is not difficult to argue a direct line of causation between these crea this creation story and cultural attitudes that value the accumulation of goods and resources over the health of the ecosystem, over the health and safety of other humans and other non-human creatures, that value human jobs and economies over the functioning of natural systems, attitudes which see these things as in opposition to each other in the first place. But there are other stories, other theologies, other groundings that share a different attitude and different possibilities. In braiding sweetgrass, Kimmerer is finding her indigenous and tribal ways of being in the world a different story, a richer, more connected one where we understand that we are not separate from the earth and its other life, but a reciprocal part that we receive and interact with the bounty of the earth as generosity, as a gift from a sacred world and not as a resource to be owned or mined or destroyed. She writes, in the settler mind, land was property, real estate, capital, or natural resources. But to our people, she says, it was everything, identity, the connection to our ancestors, the home of our non-human kinfolk, our pharmacy, our library, the source of all that sustained us. The settler mindset which she talks about, which inspired and focused the colonial powers and then interaction with all of the life they found in these lands continues, she asserts, in our market-driven economy and culture. In the market economy story, which she says, quote, has spread like wildfire with uneven results for human well-being and devastation for the natural world. But it is just a story we have told ourselves, she said, and we are free to tell another, to reclaim the old one. We must tell different stories. Hearing and honoring the indigenous voices around us is one way to do this. Learning new or old ways of interacting with the rest of nature, that nature that we are part of. Seeing ourselves as connected, as an integral part, as interrelated. Knowing in the mess of that interrelatedness that we are not alone, as Julia reminded us earlier. I can't recommend this book, Braiding Sweetgrass, highly enough. It's not really a ma how-to manual for fixing the climate crisis. Rather, it's a guide to different stories, different ways of being. I know some of you read it in one of our book groups a while ago, but I do highly recommend it. And our Unitarian Universalist tradition has, over its history, grown by listening and adapting and embracing new stories, new theologies, indigenous ways of being, and the voices and stories of our pagan neighbors and kin 
have led us to incorporate a more holistic, relational understanding, we're striving anyway, of ourselves and the natural world into our grounding values. We Unitarian Universalists are quite proud of our commitment to environmental issues. While we as a denomination are certainly not alone in our attention to these ecological issues, we understand environmental awareness to be a crucial part of what makes us Unitarian Universalists. You could make the case that this awareness is deep in our history with Emerson's writing on nature and Thoreau's experiment of living in the woods near Walden Pond. The sixth source of our living tradition, spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. And the seventh principle of our covenant with each other, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. These are certainly calls to pay attention to our ecological place in the world, reflections of the importance of our relationship with nature. And new expressions of the values and stories at our core also embrace this worldview. In the proposed revisions to our Article II statements, one of the values we embrace is interdependence. As Julia said earlier, we honor the interdependent web of all existence. We covenant to cherish Earth and all beings by creating and nurturing relationships of care and respect. With humility and reverence, we acknowledge our place in the great web of life and we work to repair harm and damaged relationships. Cherish, create, nurture, care, humility, reverence, all of those words, not just respect. Here in this congregation, we are learning to tell different stories as well, each and every day in all of our lives, learning to learn new things about our relationship with the rest of nature. We see and experience this in things that Dave said to us earlier today and our understanding of the land that this congregation lives on, not just as something to be nurtured for beauty, but for honoring it as sacred finding ways to honor the environment of this place, cultivating a home for the plants that know how to live here and for the animal life that can thrive in this place. And we could also take individual opportunities to reclaim a relationship with our natural world. Our spiritual growth doesn't just occur inside these walls or in our online spaces. We have the opportunity to experience ourselves differently by getting involved, for example, with our Camp de Beneville Pines, which we talked about a few weeks ago. If you're looking for an op here's a little advertisement in the middle of the sermon. If you're looking for an opportunity to learn more about the camp, by the way, David Pete and Randy Steele and I will be leading a day trip up to the camp on Wednesday, May 17th. We'll drive up to camp together, have a picnic lunch, and explore the beauty of the mountain for a while. Send me an email if you're interested or sign up in the lobby. There's more information coming, but please do take the opportunity. The camp is a beautiful, beautiful place, and there's still snow up there, at least there was last week. We look around us every day, and we see the growing results of environmental change. We read and hear the news, and we know that all over the world, we are experiencing extreme weather, shifting environments, and flooding, and drought, and fires. And the chemistry of our oceans and our atmosphere are changing. And none of these things affect us all equally. The impact, for example, of the changes at the Salton Sea may be giving those of us at this end of the valley a few smelly days or days with not so great air quality, but those who live nearer the sea are grappling with deep illness and poisoned living conditions. And we wonder, I know I wonder, where can we see hope? Is there hope? I think part of our hope comes in learning to tell a different story. Not a story of our separation from nature, but a story of our part in it. A story of the holy mess of our interdependence. Our understanding that the kind of thinking that got us into this mess that we're in is not the kind of thinking that will get us out of it. 
the stories that are at the core of what our society and our economy have become are not just technical stories, they are moral and spiritual. And they speak to our deepest values, and so we must tell different stories. Dave mentioned uh, Rachel Carson earlier. Rachel Carson wrote, our attitude toward nature is today critically important simply because we have now acquired a fateful power to alter and destroy nature. But we are part of nature, and our war against nature is inevitably a war against ourself. We are challenged, as humanity has never been challenged before, to prove our maturity and our mastery, not of nature, but of ourselves. Change and hope are rooted in both the individual and in the system and its story. In choosing to build and buy and drive electric cars and in reimagining our ways of living that are so dependent on individual ownership of cars. In choices to use the land around our homes differently and how we choose and buy our food and in the underlying stories and theories and theologies and worldview that, that create our cultures, create our agricultural systems. Share a different story with yourself and the world. Act to make different choices, choices that acknowledge our complicity and our power for changing things. Choices that embrace the stream of life that runs through us as it runs through the rest of the world. Choices that call us to tell the stories of connection and commitment in a world of greed and consumption. Stories that share our understanding that the effects of radical climate change will not be felt equally. And that because of our interconnectedness, we are called to work to lessen those effects and commit to protect our kin whose lives are most affected. Stories that help us to understand that even in the face of all of this, we have power. My friends, let us find and make those stories to tell to each other. Listen to those stories. Share them with our neighbors and our children. New and old stories of connection and solidarity, gratitude and sacred relationship. May those be the stories in our hearts as we join in the work of building a different, thriving and sacred world. May it be so. In gratitude for that world, I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit as we sing together our closing hymn, For the Beauty of the Earth.
Please join together as we extinguish the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. In her lecture at the 2010 General Assembly, Native activist Winona LeDuc called us to recognize the responsibility involved in our interdependence. Here we are, she said, you and you got a shot at doing something great. We all do. We are the people who are here now. Those ones who are not here yet are counting on us to do the right thing. Our ancestors worked really hard, she said, to have some dignity. They are counting on us to carry on a legacy where there is dignity for all our relations, whether they have wings or fins or roots or paws. Carrying the hope and the commitment to that legacy in our hearts and our hands. Go in peace, my friends, to love and serve the world.